Good evening, everyone. It is so nice to have you here at Melanin Stories Matters. This is a special show that is Indigenous Peoples Day as we honor the Native American Heritage Month. And it is so exciting. We are going to have an evening filled with six wonderful Indigenous storytellers that will introduce themselves in their native language and they will share stories about their heritage and their families and what it's like to be Native American uh, in today's times especially. There will be some content that might be a little tough. Uh, sometimes some language will be used. So this does have some uh, adult language in there. So just be prepared if there's younger children in the room. Okay, so let's start with something that's kind of important. Let's talk about the white elephant in the room. Well, that would be me. <laughs> yes, um, I'm white. And the reason why though, uh, Melanin Stories Matters was formulated was as I was watching the, as we all were watching the, the police brutality and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and violence and, and whatnot, it became real that we have to do something to, to change, to, to, to be kinder to that, to be kinder to people. And I realized as a storyteller, I'm a professional storyteller. I'm also a storytelling coach for executives. So I have a company called Story Fruition and I coach executives on how to be better storytellers in their leadership. It occurred to me that protests were getting tear gassed a lot and COVID is definitely not something that we want to get exposed to, but we can create a storytelling avenue of this platform where we're highlighting the voices and stories of black, indigenous and people of color so that we can hear their stories and we can start to realize, listen, we all have melanin. I have melanin, I just have less. Um, but our hearts are all the same shade. And so that's what we're here for tonight is to step into the other shoe and just listen and learn and grow. This is a place for love and support. This is not a place for trolling. If you troll, you will be removed from this, from this party here. Um, but this is our living room activism and our rally. And as you listen tonight to these storytellers, look into their eyes. They're gonna be looking into that camera and, and communicating and bearing their souls to you. These stories are about eight or nine minutes each. They took weeks to come up and really boil down to, as they heard me say oftentimes, let's get let's cut the fat and get to the meat of, of your core story. And they've worked so hard and I'm very proud of every single one of them. So thank you. And um, let's do a little uh, housekeeping. Okay, so, you, so you're out there in YouTube land and you've got a chat and that's wonderful. If you wanna say where you're, you're dialing in from, that would be fabulous. Go ahead and let us know. As well as if you see a storyteller or after they've told their story and you wanna just go, that really like wowed me or something, please do because it's nice for them to see some positive feedback, okay? Um, so that that that's great. Uh, this is also a night of, of giving. And so every single one of our storytellers does have um, an organization that's dear to their heart. And we're going to share with you links that if you could give to them, I mean, even if you gave $3 to these organizations, that adds up. We have a very hearty sized audience out there tonight. And that would be really wonderful. There's also um, a tip jar that if you start like, that was amazing and you want to tip the storytellers, thank you in advance. That is a link that we will send over to you as well. And um, all of the money that we pool together will go only to the storytellers. So um, thank you in advance on that. The ticket proceeds will be going to uh, some organizations and we are, we are uh, looking at, or we're going to be giving to the missing and murdered indigenous women. It's one of our storytellers tonight's uh, tale that she's going through right now. And so um, may we help them with the searches that they have. Um, and that is it. This is, the, so this is our evening, okay? And so we're going to start with our first storyteller, all right? And this is Donna Christian. And she will be uh, coming here from Denver, Colorado area. She's been an educator for over 40 years. And in this story, she's going to be talking to us a bit about identity, as well as 
what it's like this time of year. And this story is called The Fall. So please welcome Donna Christian. Ha mataki api, Donna Christian, machapi kshto, rosebud a matha, nali ha, ingawid, a watiha, iu ha chanta, washta nape, chiu zapi. Hi everyone, my name is Donna Christian. I am Sijangu and Dina. What I said in Lakota language is I greet you with a warm heart. I know you are probably wondering what is Sijangu and Dina. I identify as my two tribal nations. And you might be more familiar with terms Indian, American Indian, Native American, Native, First Nations, Indigenous, and Aboriginal. The first three terms I will address are Indian, American Indian, and Native American. Indian came about by a man who was lost and ended up in what we know today as Havana. When he arrived, he called the Taino and the other indigenous people Indian because he thought he landed in the West Indies. Over time, after America was founded, we were called American Indians. This was to distinguish us from Indians who were born in India. Then by act of Congress in 1984, they decided to rename us once again because they had to create another race category that would include actual Indians from India who are now born in the US. So they named us Native Americans, again, without our consent or without consulting us. So for 500 years, we have been called terms that we do not identify as. These terms have been forced upon us. You will see American Indians still in federal policies today. I say that these three terms are not derogatory. They are just incorrect. The next terms are indigenous and aboriginal. These are anthropological or scientific terms. You can find indigenous or aboriginal people in Australia or New Zealand or other countries. These are the original peoples of their homelands. When I say indigenous, I am referring to the original peoples of the Americas from the northern part of North America to the southern tip of Chile in South America. The next terms are First Nations and Native. I prefer to be called these terms or indigenous as an umbrella term over all the tribal nations. Sioux and Navajo are the governmental terms for Sijangu and Dine. I do not identify as either of these governmental terms. My mother is Sijangu and her mother is Sijangu, and her mother was Sijangu. I can go back eight generations of Sijangu women. Sijangu means the burnt thigh people. This is where I come from. There is no honor in the other terms I mentioned, and it would be a dishonor to say I was anything other than Sijangu, because this is who my grandmother told me who I am. There is no pride in all of the other terms. Every indigenous person identifies as they see fit. The best way I have heard to ask someone who is indigenous is to ask them what their tribal nations are. I am Sijangu and Dine. The fall. Looking at the calendar, it's September. Fall is a difficult time as an indigenous person. First, it starts with me watching football. I'm enjoying the game in my cozy fall sweater with my pumpkin spice coffee. <laughs> when all of a sudden, I see the head of a native person on a stake during the football game. You can hear the fans doing the tomahawk chop and I can see them with their war paint on. As we move into October, imagine a little girl coming home with her scholastic news. She tells her mother that Columbus sailed the ocean blue and she is quickly interrupted. Her mother doesn't allow the C word to be spoken in her home. I call it the other C word. It was Columbus. Don't say his name in this house, she said, because he raped, he pillaged, he murdered, he decapita decapitated babies and fed them to dogs. His name will never be said in this house. October 31st. The doorbell rings. I open the door 
and I see a Pocahontas. Pocahontas was a child, not this adult sexualized Disney character standing on my front porch. By this time, my trauma stemming from the mascot issue and the C word informs my reaction to this young woman who does not understand her misrepresent misrepresentation and appropriation of our culture. I am hurt and I am angry. No sooner does America hang up their Pocahontas costumes than on November 1st, we are told Americans now honor us. It's Native American Heritage Month. I walk into work or my child's classroom and I am quickly greeted with Happy Thanksgiving. How do I respond? My mother taught me to be a good relative and to wake up each day thankful. How did we commodify a simple life lesson? We share a month with a holiday that has been based on a lie and used as propaganda for American patriotism. We are reminded that the first Thanksgiving was an act of genocide committed by the pilgrims. The same pilgrims printed on those coloring sheets that you bring home from school each year with your turkey made from your hand. As we take time off to reflect and spend time with family, I call my brother who served this country for 25 years and I ask him to come by. He says, no, I have my pizza and my football. Happy Thanksgiving. Wow. Donna, thank you. That was really, 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 really informational and educational. Um, when we first started talking a few weeks back, I have shared this reality that you've told me to so many people um, because it really moved me and it was very awakening for me. I, I mean, I grew up in the Midwest and I believed everything that my social studies book told me. <laughs> right. I did. And when you were saying the, the pictures of the of the Indians and the pilgrims and they're in the wigwam and they're sharing and breaking bread. Uh, yeah. So tell us more about your work as an educator. So I, I began my journey um, in education with my mother uh, 43 years ago. So I was five years old and we started talking to schools and organizations in the state of Nebraska so my mom's little claim to fame was that she'd been to every single school in Nebraska. So, wow, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you have quite a few organizations that you're uh, bringing awareness to, to tonight's audiences. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those? Yeah. So the first one is Sovereign Bodies Institute, mm -hmm. and um, I just want to bring awareness to the data that is collected for the missing mur and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Um, plus, mm -hmm. uh, it's a movement that impacts our um, our community, and um, the data that's been collected is incorrect and doesn't include um, all of the states where the data. Um, should be collected from. So Sovereign Bodies Institute is working to to really do a good job and a better job of researching and collecting that data. So the number that I've been reading for the missing and murdered Indigenous women, it was 5,600. So you're saying that that's not, that's not high enough? That number only came from 17 states. So wow. as you know, there's 50 states in the United States. So that's not even half of the collected data. And um, another thing about law enforcement that we've learned is that um, we are not identified as indigenous people. So even though my driver driver's license says that I'm Native American or American Indian, Alaska Native, um, on the reports, they will mark us down as white or Hispanic. So um, it's important that law enforcement checks the right box and does their, their due diligence so that we can collect correct data. So Sovereign Bodies Institute is really trying to do that. Amazing, okay, all right. And then uh, you have uh, the Chinook Fund? Yes, so Chinook Fund is something that I, 
I just, um, in the last year or so, have become a part of, and I sit on their board, so that's super exciting. Um, but I took part in their spring cohort giving project um, this this past spring in 2020, and um, it was really a life changing event for me to learn um, more about social justice and how how Indigenous people fit in that realm of of Black liberation and um, how we can serve each other in our communities better. So I really enjoy working with um, Chinook Fund and how they um, support person of color and their communities and the uh, um, different organizations and making sure they get funded. So I want to thank that organization because they've been extremely supportive yeah. of Melanin Stories Matter. So thank you, Chinook Fan Fund, for what you've been doing. Yeah. Look at there she is. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> and then the American Indian College Fund. Yes. Um, I American Indian College Fund helps to support indigenous students moving on to higher education. Um, they also work with all of the tribal um, colleges and universities that are in the United States. And it's just important to make sure that that funding comes through and um, just to educate ourselves on the fact that um, we do have our own colleges and universities on our tribal nations. And um, yeah, so I believe in that cause. Um, education is always um, uh, number one for me. So yeah, definitely it is. Yeah. Well, thank you. You did that tonight. And I do want to share with the audience that uh, we actually have some University of Wisconsin students yeah. because Professor uh, Larry Nesper said, if you go to this show about Indigenous Peoples Day, I will give you extra credit. So mm -hmm. I hope that uh, <laughs> they're feeling good because you just gave uh, quite a bit of history. So thank Yay. you. You yeah, can go relax thank you. now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you all right okay so this is how it's going to to work that was our first of the six storytellers um i thought that was fabulous and our next storyteller is someone who actually is coming back from our last show where we emphasize your vote matters and she was very much a part of helping the activism to flip arizona so good job Don. <laughs> we have Don Manuelito and she has very rich uh, history from her. She's the sixth generation uh, from Chief Manuelito who actually signed the treaties. And then it's your grandfather was in the original Code Talkers, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so she's, she's, she's got quite a bit of history, but she's also very, very passionate about gut health. She is a wellness and a healer, um, has an advanced degree in this, and so she's very committed to the health of, of Indigenous people because it's changed a lot, and she's going to talk about that now in this next story that we call From the Inside Out. Take it away, Dawn. Dawate, she, Don Manuelito, Gonse. Yate, she, a Don Manuelito, Yenishe. Hello and good evening. I just greeted you in both Apache and Diné language, as that is who I am as a Native American woman. It was 2015 and as I approached the door to the gymnasium of one of many on our, tri our tribal lands, my mother and I walk into the doors and we look and we search for a seat and as we're looking for a seat, I noticed people, you could feel the heaviness, you could feel the, the hurt, the pain, the grieving. We find a seat and we, we get settled. And as we're looking and we're sitting, just observing, waiting for services to start of my uncle's funeral. I look around and I see people still coming in, getting settled. And I see not too many people, but enough to open my eyes. And that's people that are using walkers, canes, wheelchairs. They're not too much older than myself. And as I look around, it saddens my heart. My uncle Danny, he was a, a happy man. He was full of life, lived life raised his kids, and this 
disease from the inside out that we cannot see starts with the toes, then the foot, then the leg, and eventually our life, his life. This disease was called diabetes. Among our Navajo, our native nations and indigenous people across this country, we suffer from this disease inside out and the many, many others that have come along the way. It's painful to watch my, my people and it's why it brings me to my passion. And that passion is fueled again more recently with another, another illness and that's COVID, COVID-19. Yeah, the other C word. And you know, it's painful. It's taken friends and family more recent in this past 10 months, nine months, eight months. But in the past two weeks, it took a dear loved one, an older brother, which is my cousin. I got that call that morning. It was not news that I wanted to hear that my family had been affected and that they were gonna be quarantined, that they were gonna be treated and that my brother was on a ventilator. Days later, his father and his other brother, my other brother, also on ventilators. And just after that, his life, again, another loved one, gone. This enrages me because for hundreds of years, we as our people, our native communities have suffered, suffered <laughs> from colonization and what it's brought here. What we've had to endure and what we've had to overcome and fight through and battle through, not just the taking of our lands and we had to, we're able to go back home and, and that journey in itself, taking lives, but from the rations that were given from the federal government of infected blankets with diseases, rotten meat, so we could survive only to, to try and just make us disappear. No, none of that worked because we're still here. Our food system has tainted us genetically. The fast foods, the processed foods that were given to us to help us survive. Yeah, no, we've been, we've been tainted. We've been hurt and that just fury rages inside of me because as I'm passionate about what I teach from the inside out, gut health, to help fight these disparities among our people of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, which were all foreign to us before colonization. We ate from the land. We ate our corns, we grew them, corns, beans, squash, all these indigenous foods, our herbs, our plants, the medicinal medicines from our herbs and plants that we could use to fight off any kind of common cold not a virus, not a disease. We were physically fit. We were, we had that in cardio endurance and we were able to overcome these things. However, that silent killer, that silent killer is exactly what's happening now from the inside out. Gut health is of my priority and importance to teach our native and indigenous communities. Reclaiming our wellness, taking it back to our indigenous food sources because they're still available. Our warriors, 
our resilience to all of this, we are still here and we are rising up again in this wellness movement that is happening. So we no longer have to make the choice between healthcare, the lack of healthcare that we do have on, on the different reservations across the nation. 2.5 million approximately Native American, Indigenous women, men and women, warriors, fight these battles every day. And that's because of lack of, and our healthcare system is failing us tremendously. But we will rise as warriors once again in resilience as our ancestors have taught us to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I know that this past couple of weeks has been tremendously hard for you with COVID and your family. And we talked about actually, do you not want to do the show? Are you going to be okay? And you know what she said? She says, no, more than ever, I need to speak up because of this. And so I just really appreciate your, uh, your strength and your resilience. You're amazing. And I want to thank you because you also helped bring so many of the storytellers into the show. You're so connected. <laughs> but thank you. yeah, so tell us a little bit more about your work as far as uh, building the awareness that we need to return back to more of a clean eating style, put down the taco bell and make a fresh one. <laughs> you know, like, how are you, how are you getting that word out and how is it being received? The funny thing, the first thing that came to mind right there was we used to call it taco hell in high school. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but that was yeah. just, we were young, we didn't know. Um, yeah. What I do is I am a health and wellness coach and I contract and teach and educate our native communities about gut health from the mm -hmm. inside out. What does it look like? Because it's something we don't see. So mm -hmm. when it's when it's something we don't see, we don't pay much mind to it until we see the outside of us. So what happens on the inside is a direct reflection of what's going on on the outside. And a lot of that is the first thing we see is obesity rates and overweight. Um, and then the check engine lights come on, you know, you start to get um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, you know, so getting those, bringing that awareness to our people sheds light on how we can overcome some of these illnesses. And with the COVID right now, it's not if, it's when. Are we able to get through it? Are we? Is our body able to fight through it? And that's where our indigenous people and the disparities that we face. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the unknown. Yeah, because right? their systems are already compromised with the diabetes and, yes. and yeah, the cholesterol. Well, prayers to you, all of us. We all have to be doing our part right now, um, protecting each other masking, washing hands, but also you're right. I always go right to food. Whenever I'm like offer, it's like, oh, you know. In our native communities too, that's how we gather. We gather mm -hmm. with food, we gather with meeting and we, we, we sit and we tell stories around our table and that's what brings our families together. And, but however, it's not the good foods that we used to eat and taking that back to our indigenous foods and teaching that and getting our systems back into sync with who we are as native people, you know, that we can fight so many, so many diseases. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's great. It's very noble work and thank you, you know, so good luck with, with your mission, right? Yeah. Okay. You can relax. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, so I just want everyone to know that we will be bringing all the storytellers back at the end of the show and you can ask questions and get to know them. And, um, but right now if she's finished. She can, whew, you did great. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. So, uh, our next storyteller is coming from Oahu, Hawaii, or the 808, as Moon likes to say. And he has been just such a joy. He has been, let's see, his background is he's a 
been in the military police. He's been a football player. He's been uh, a drill sergeant. And he's a musician. And he teaches all over the planet, almost all day long. He's on a lesson on Zoom. So we're gonna hear some more of Moon's music. Um, he's just a delight. And so in this next story that he's going to tell, it's called Aloha from the Bible Belt. Please welcome Moon Kahele. Mahalo e kekuu, Melissa. E kalamai kai ina mea pao, e meka ma kuu hai mo'olelo. Good evening everybody out there and to all. Hope everybody's doing okay. And to our fellow storytellers, aloha. I'm Moon Kahele from the island of Oahu, from the 50th state of Hawaii, as I refer to it as the 808. One thing I learned about growing up in the 808 is the word aloha. Aloha to me is the essence of sharing being loved, finding peace and harmony. And also finding that mutual understanding of respect for one another. Aloha. The title of my story is Aloha from the Bible Belt. You know, I grew up in a multicultural community on Oahu. I learned discrimination and segregation at an early age. For example, the communities that I lived around had people like the Japanese, as they were called, Buddha heads. The Chinese, they were called Pake. The Filipinos were called Flips. The Blacks were called Popolo. The Whites were called Haole. And the Hawaiians were called Kanaks or Kanaka. So raised up with this type of labeling system, if I may, was quite an eye opener, not realizing that it would help me later on in my adult life. I grew up, went to school, played sports, even graduated with this community. When I graduated from high school, my dad encouraged me to join the military, which I did. The U.S. Army shipped me from the 808 to the West Coast, and eventually I ended up in the Bible Belt. If you don't know what the Bible Belt or the area or the region of the Bible Belt, let me give you my description of the Bible Belt. It's comprised of a few southeastern states that socially conservative. They are staunch church goers big-hearted people, and they're a real close family-knit society. As I did my time in the U.S. Army, I decided to get out of the Army. And when I got discharged, I stayed in the state of Alabama, the Bible Belt. With an honorable, honorable discharge, I, I went up north and and uh, went to this uh, university. It's above junior college, but below division one AA. It's a division two college. Applied, got accepted. Then I heard through the grapevine that the university team was having a tryout for walk-ons. Wow, got my attention. I went out and made the team. Young man from Hawaii, Polynesian, playing for a team, a football team in the state of Alabama. Whew. My experience being a football player, coming into the stadium or leaving the stadium after games, I could hear whispers in the crowd, murmuring, one particular whisper I heard was, what in hell is this piece of shit guy I think he is coming here in Alabama, taking the spot of a boy that was born and raised here? 
Yeah, it hurt. But I was there for one thing, to play ball, to play college ball. So I let that, like water off a duck's back. I moved on. It's all about moving on. I met a Southern Belle not long after that. We had a lot of things in common. We liked school, study halls, and we threw down a few cold ones together. We'd seen each other as friends for about two or three semesters. So we thought about taking it to the next level and started dating, not knowing that one of the traditions there is meeting the parent. So once football season was over with, we planned on a Friday afternoon when no classes was going on to drive to her parents' home and meet their parents. And I was excited because we were taking our friendship to the dating level. As we drove, we shared. She told me about her home and a four-bedroom four home with a wraparound porch, five acres of land in the back of their home where her dad works on. They grew corn, okra, and beans. So I'm telling myself, this is a hard working man, a farmer working with his hands. Total respect, immediately. So it was getting late. The sun was going down at a distance. So we finally arrived at their beautiful Southern traditional home. Drove around, parked on a gravel driveway. We didn't get out of the car yet. We were so excited. But then again, at that time, the porch light turned on. Two figures came out of the door. The lady up front, her mom, was a tall drink of water, probably about 5'10", maybe 5'11". She had beautiful blonde hair with silver streaks through it, and she combed it back with a little bun on top, and she was wearing her Sunday dress. What a beautiful sight. Behind her, a few steps behind her, was her dad. He was shorter than her mom, a little balding on the top, a little chubby. He still had his muddy boots on, his dirty jeans, and his sweaty flannel shirt. And he was smoking the cigarette with about a quarter-inch ash, kind of dangling. And both of them made their way to the car that we just pulled up in. Finally, we opened the door and the interior light of the car turned on. I stepped out, she stepped out, her mom stopped in her tracks. She introduced me and to her mother and dad. Her mom stopped and moved on the side to allow her dad to move forward. He looked at me, he looked at her. He looked at me, took out his cigarette, dapped it over the rail to the ground. As it hit the ground, he looked at me, he looked at her and said, get that damn nigger off my property. I turned to her, I said, I'll go back to the campus and I'll come by, come back Sunday and pick you up. On my way home by myself in an empty car, I realized what the word aloha meant, the understanding and the relationship of and respect of others, and the lack of aloha in the Bible Belt. And mahalo to everybody. Stay safe, stay blessed. Ah, oh, mahalo, mahalo. That, that story, those stories, um, they just, really moved me because what's interesting is is that you yourself as a pure hawaiian was raised to be racist right where you're you're, yeah. na- you're labeling people by their their culture and their skin tones yes so when when it was thrown at you um did you think about that like what went through your mind when it was suddenly coming at you believe it or not there melissa i, I was kind of used to it you know, you live in a small island, a small community where it just bounces off each other. It mm-hmm. also bounced off of me. The statement mm-hmm. in the stands, the football stands, uh, you know, that, that piece of shit, you know, statement, it, it got under my skin. Yeah. But like I, you know, it, I, I grew up with those type of statements or and, and sometimes you get used to it and it's like water off a duck's back. 
Mm. But, I don't want it to be water off a of duck's debt no, back, no. you know, right? <laughs> why we're here. But, but the statement that her father made to me, that's mm -hmm. the one that really cut to the bone. Yeah. It, it, the words cut to the bone. Yeah. You know, this is like the, the, the late 70s, early 80s. And yeah, there was, you know, there was a lot of tension between the white and the black folks, not only in that part of the country, but everywhere. Mm -hmm. And still is. Um, that still is. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I was growing up in a, in a multicultural labeling type of community. It kind of prepared, well, matter of fact, it did prepare me for it. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of took the high road. You know, I could have taken the low road and, you know, said something in retaliation, but I, you know, I realized that I'm representing not only my culture, my, my family, but I represent me and my integrity and my own character. Yeah. Because uh, although I've been reckless in many things in my life, that's one thing I was very sensitive. As a matter of fact, I got kids, adult kids now, living in the state of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So for me to ask them how they feel probably wouldn't be any different because they're pure Hawaiian, raised in North Carolina and South Carolina, so I'm sure they've learned to adjust themselves. Mm -hmm. But yeah, now, words are cutting. They really it's are. Tough. It's tough. Well, you, you told a beautiful story and um, yeah, mahalo from the 808. And um, we're gonna listen to some more original music by by our moon. He's going to, we're going to play, play that now. And it's just a very few minutes, take a stretch, listen to the music, enjoy. Um, Moon, you did a wonderful job as well. I want to thank you. You worked so hard these past few weeks, and it was just a delight to um, see you craft that story. So thank you. Mahalo. Yeah, mahalo no iloa. Thank you very much. Okay. So we will listen to some music now.
please go check out Moon's work. And um, that was just stunning. I just want to play it all day long. So thank you, Moon, for sharing that with us. Um, and as you see, we're back. And yes, if you could like us on social, that would be wonderful. We've got plans for 2021 and doing more of these curated shows that will highlight and amplify the Black, Indigenous, and people of color stories. Because we need to keep telling these stories and finding them. So if you want to tell a story, go to our website and we have a, a form you can fill out and, and, and let us know the story that you're thinking that maybe when you face some racism um, or you were saved by someone who maybe had been tough on you, something like that, just submit it and we will uh, we'll put it into our consideration. So we will have quite a few shows next year as well as highlight individual storytellers. So um, thank you for your support. Join our newsletter. We'll keep you posted on, on so much more. Okay, we're in part, we're in act two now. And uh, our next storyteller is uh, Michael Smith and he is from Window Rock, Navajo Nation, Arizona. And I have had so much fun working with you. <laughs> it has been really quite joyful as well. And um, he, so Michael is very immersed in not only what it's like to be a Marine, but he also knows a lot about a very important subject matter that many of us may not have known. Because again, I don't think I read about it when I was growing up in, in school. You know, if it wasn't in my social studies book, I didn't know. So I know a lot more now because of Michael and his story that he's going to share firsthand that we call Dad, our Navajo Code Talker. Thank you and take it away. Yeah, it's a Michael Smith. Yeah, Jami Hanu. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Smith. I am Eagle Clan from the Pueblo of Acoma. Which is, I was born for red running into water. That's my dad's clan. <clears throat> um, I have a secret. I really do have a secret. And this secret is about a group of Navajo warriors that created a code that saved this country and our people. It's December. 7th, 1941. I'm reading the newspaper and I see that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor and that they have advanced across the Pacific Ocean. And I'm wondering, what am I going to do? Because they can come on to mainland, they can come on to the top, Navajo land and bomb our people and bring war to the four sacred mountains. What am I going to do? What am I going to do as a young Navajo warrior? I'm going to take the fight to them. How can I do this? I'm going to join the most elite fighting force in the world, the United States Marine Corps. How can I do the most damage? I'll be a pilot. I'll be a pilot. I think that's how I can do the most damage. So I go down and talk to my my buddies, Samuel Billison and Virgil Kirk, and we talk about the war, and we talk about how devastating it is that they're coming to the United States, to the homeland. So we decide to go down to the recruiter station. The recruiter immediately takes the my buddies and uh, tells me that I'm too young. I didn't have a birth certificate then, so I turn around and I walk back in and I give another date that is old, that makes me older, December 25th, 1925. I was actually <laughs> born in March, in springtime. That's what my, my mom said my, my birthday was. So 
we go down to the recruiter station, um, we enlist. And I go to boot camp fall, that following year when I when I finish my uh, sophomore year. And uh, boot camp was pretty easy. I thought it was going to be tough, but it wasn't it. Uh, at least you got to eat all the time. <laughs> um, so we passed boot camp. After I graduated boot camp, I went to get my orders. I was excited to go to flight school. And my drill instructor says, sorry, son, you don't have a diploma. Even though you passed all the aptitude tests, you don't have a diploma, so you're not qualified to fly, fly a plane. Are you Navajo? Are you Native American? Come with me, son. Grab your bags. I grab my bags. And uh, I'm taken down to Camp Elliot. I go to Camp Elliot and I walk into these barracks. Sheesh. Nothing but Indians, mostly Navajos. So we start uh, finding out what's going on here. So as I find out that I'm going to comm school, and when I come when I, when I come to this barracks, I find out that they're actually testing us, testing us Navajos on our fluency and the language. Navajo in English, whether or not we can read or write, some men got weeded out. Then we were take, given more tests in reference to our intelligence. So more men got weeded out. Then we got sent to comm school, and that was our MOS. That was what we, um, that was who we were assigned, radio men. So we learned every form of communication that the Marine Corps had. Morse code, Semrify, um, radios, telephone. We learned how to operate all this equipment to repair it. Because you can't just order a new one, you know? So I go, um, I graduate uh, comm school. And then they take me back to Camp Elliott. And I go into this classroom and I look around and I'm kind of shocked because there's all these Navajo Marines sitting in wooden chairs and desks and something that I never seen, a Navajo instructor. And they were talking Navajo, but I didn't know what they were talking about. I learned that they we're learning the Navajo code. The Navajo code took the Navajo language and created a counterpart in the English language in military terms. So like say for instance, the eggs Eggs, for instance, they were bombs. But the code word was Yenji. Submarines were um, ironfish, fish, low. Divisions were, uh, were uh, our troops were named after clans. So like divisions was Ashihi, Ashihi clan. And so that's uh, that's how they did it. But um, eventually I graduated from Navajo Code Talker School. They put me into, into um, battle. When there were uh, Navajos, so this was a secret code. And the Japanese eventually found out that it was a Native American language. They found out it was Navajo. So they started capturing, they, they started looking for Navajos, captured a Navajo that was in the army and tortured him. He um, 
he was on the radio and he couldn't understand what they were talking about. They're talking about eggs. So they must be talking about breakfast. The co-talkers are calling an airstrike. <clears throat> so this goes back to the very beginning of my experience with learning this secret. My father came home from the, uh, when the code was declassified in 1968, my father came home from Chicago. He had been invited with other Navajo code talkers to the annual convention, the fourth Marine annual convention in Chicago. And he was getting all dressed up, getting his eye tied, and he was, you know, it's pretty exciting getting ready for this. When he came home, he had a medal. And the medal was of Ira Hayes on a horse and the raising of the flag of Iwo Jima in the back. I was seven years old. And when I saw the medal, I was just amazed at the craftsmanship. And so my father must have done something very special to receive this. Later on, he received the uh, 2000 Navajo Code Talker Congressional Medal. And uh, his, uh, his thought about medals was, I don't really care for medals. What I care for, what really matters to me is the gratitude of the people. The people expressing their appreciation for us using our language to help our people, to help our home. Code word, Nama. These were the Nama Code Talkers. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, good job. <laughs> oh, my Thank you. God, I love that story. Um, it's just so amazing. So they were basically living technology. Because you were saying right. that code would take how long in the in the traditional way to decode something? So something would come in, right? Right. And it'd take 45 minutes to download it. Right. So the technology at the time was actually you would um, get a message and then you would code it. And the coding machine would take about 45 minutes to code it. You would send it. They would receive it. And it would take 45 minutes to decode it. And then, so it's an hour and a half by the time you receive the message. But get this, the Japanese were still using that technology against the United States. And the Marine Corps had the secret weapon, the mm -hmm. Navajo Code Talkers. Instantaneous transmission of messages. Call that real time. And it turned the tide on the war. It did, and and it was uh, Iwo Jima, right? That um, all the islands, <clears throat> all yeah. the islands that were that were retaken, yes. But on mm -hmm. Iwo Jima, there was a um, a Signal Corps officer, Major Major uh, Connor, mm -hmm. who made the statement that it was he was in the Fifth Marine Signal Corps, and he made the statement: if it weren't for the Navajos, we would have never taken Iwo Jima. Wow. So, yeah. wow. Wow. So your dad and all the code talkers, true, true heroes, true, true heroes. So, so amazing. Um, so I know that you still honor, you still know some of the men. There's a few that are still here. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and you've done, actually, you've done a festival and tell us about that. I was, I've been very fortunate to have had a relationship with, with several of these men. Um, and uh, they actually had celebrated a day called Navajo Code Talker Day on their own, which was proclaimed by Ronald Reagan in 1982 as National Navajo Code Talker Day. Mm -hmm. When I heard about this, <clears throat> I, um, I asked the Code Talkers if I could throw them a party. And so we started the event in Winter Rock called Navajo Code Talker Day. But to this day, it's grown to where 
it's not just a party for the men, but it's also educational and we're reaching out to tell their story and to and to have this history, you know, go forward because we don't we want them to be known. We want we want people to know their legacy and how they contributed to this country. This morning you said to me they were warriors and this was their land and they were going to fight for it. And that was right. Yeah. Right. There was one now old co talker, his name is Samuel So and and he made a, a statement when he joined when he joined the uh, now the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And his statement was he went to defend our people. He went to defend the Navajo people, the Diné. Mm -hmm. And when he came home after he was discharged, he realized that the whole United States was our people. The, the United States is our country. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he went to war. All children of the creator. Country. Yeah, just beautiful culture, really. Well, you did great. You can go relax for a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> more of your tea. Um, thank you very much. All right. I hope everyone's enjoying this show. Um, we have two more storytellers to share with you tonight. And this next storyteller, this is sensitive situations uh, that Pam Smith is Pamela Smith is going to share with us. Um, it uh, in storytelling in these curated shows, there's a rule that you should tell scar stories, not wound stories, because it's it's harder when it's still fresh. And Several times I was like, Pam, can you do this story because you're still living through it? And she said, yes, I have to. And so I already just so much heart for you and what you're going to be sharing with us and your family. Um, and this will be a story that centers around a very important topic and that is the missing and murdered indigenous, indigenous women that we mentioned earlier. And so in this story, we call it Finding Aubrey. So please welcome Pamela Smith. Yo, did you? My name is Pamela Smith. It's a warm summer night, 1997. My mother, my sister, and I are sitting outside the home when suddenly the front screen door slowly creaks open and out walks this beautiful little angel, about three years old carrying a bundle of bananas about half of his size. And uh, so Austin comes down the stairs and walks to my mother and says, I want a nan or a nanny. And Austin knew who he was from an early age. Um, and my little brother Christian is six months older than um, Austin and they're very close and they're both part of the LGBT community. So my mother would say, it's just a phase. And I told her, no, it's not a phase. She's like, oh, it's a phase. They'll grow out of it. I'm like, no, it's not a phase. They know who they are. And uh, I've loved them from the moment they, they were born. And regardless of, you know, how they want to live their life, I love them. So fast forward to Aubrey's, Austin's junior high years. He transitions to Aubrey. And Aubrey, she, she has always been a kind-hearted soul. You know, she would give the shirt off her back to you. She had friends that would, you know, be in trouble or have family problems. And, and she would take them home with her and offer them a place to sleep, food, clothing, whatever she had to offer, she would give. And her transition began in junior high and she and my brother, like I said, they're six months apart. So they went to school together. You know, they walked home together. They were each other's shadows and they would get chased home. They lived in a small community in Northeast Oklahoma and you know, they, that community was not very open to the LGBT community. And to this day, I don't believe it is. 
any more than when they were growing up. And they would get chased home by other kids and they would yell um, homophobic slurs, make threats to them. Through all of through all of that they've had to endure. Aubrey, you know, as an adult, I would hear stories and it would upset me and I would, you know, be like, well, who is it? And she was like, Aunt Pam, it's okay. I'll just pray for them. That that's who Aubrey was. Um one of the things I miss the most about her is she would come up to me when I'd see her and the first thing she'd do is hug me and give me a big sloppy kiss on the cheek and say, I love you, Aunt Pam. And you know, she's she's always been brave. She's she's very she's always been brave and resilient. So fast forward to March of 2019. March 16th, to be exact, I was notified by a family friend and, and uh, she asked me if Aubrey was missing. I said, not that I'm aware of. So I contacted local law enforcement and they confirmed that a report was taken on March 11th. No family contacted Christian and I, so that's how we found out. And Aubrey had moved away to New Mexico in 2018 and she began her physical transformation of her upper body there. When she returned, she returned to live with her mom, her mom's boyfriend and her brother. And they all were into drugs. Um, several had made a statement um, since Aubrey's gone missing that she was new to the needle, so she did fall into that lifestyle when she returned. Her mom's boyfriend um, is a white man who comes from a background of money. So he has always acted superior and him and Aubrey didn't see eye to eye. And so, you know, he would look down on Native Americans. Um, with the, and uh, the story from when Aubrey went missing, her mom gave very specific details, but her mom stated that she had just woke up at 3.30 in the morning and was walking to the restroom and she, it's just strange. Aubrey's last post on social media was February 26th, and I find that strange. They claim that she went missing on March 9th. On March 19th, I speak to um, the investigator who's handling my niece's case, because I, on March 16th, I started making calls and didn't get nowhere with anybody over the weekend. So on March 19th, I actually spoke to the detective handling her case. And I introduced myself and explained why I'm calling, you know, is there any leads? And he says, he goes, well, why do you think she's missing? He says, we don't believe she's a missing person. I was like, well, she can be gullible and naive. And he laughs, this condescending laugh. He says, well, he goes, no, he goes, we believe very well that she knows what she's doing. And I said, how can you say that she's a missing person? She wouldn't just go and and uh, stop all contact with everybody in the family. He says, well, we just don't believe she's a missing person. I said, how can you say that? He said, well, because of her lifestyle. I said, wait, what do you mean her lifestyle? I said, because she's transgender? No, no, just because of her lifestyle. I was like, so you're telling me that because of her lifestyle that my niece's life isn't worth searching for. He says, that's not what I'm saying. I said, that's exactly what you're saying. He says, well, you know, she's got 500 Facebook friends who are male. I said, and? He says, well, we just don't believe she's a missing person. I was like, so because of her lifestyle and her 500 friends on Facebook are male, that her life isn't worth searching for? He said, I didn't say that. I said, yes, you did. I said, that's exactly what you're saying. He said, no, we didn't get the resources. He says, well, you know, she's known to use an illegal substance. I said, so because of her lifestyle, because 500 of her friends on Facebook are male, and because she's known to use an illegal substance that her life isn't worth searching for. He says, that's not what I'm saying. I said, that's exactly what you're saying. So after that conversation, I learned that he's known in the community. He's an older white man and he has no respect for Native Americans or any of color. He treats them like they don't matter. And he confirmed it with my conversation with him.
I, it was devastating. You know, we, um, it's one of the worst things to ever have to go through. We have been, been blessed with some people that have came to help us search for Aubrey. And one is a wonderful K-19. And at one point, well, the K-19, the, the dogs that they brought, they're human remain detection dogs. And uh, so they're certified HRD dogs. So there was a location that we went to and they found what appeared to be a shallow grave and with the black jacket that Aubrey was described wearing last. And so the search team came off the hill and contacted this investigator because he was there at the fire department waiting with us. And he was the only law enforcement there. So he didn't go up there. He went to call the sheriff to see if they had anybody come, you know, set. This was on a Sunday, the Sunday before Memorial Day. He comes back about 20, 30 minutes later and says that he contacted the sheriff and they had nobody. And that the anthropologist slash uh, medical examiner could not make it out until Tuesday. I was thinking, I didn't know the Emmy, you know, took a holiday off. So they didn't return. They left this site unsecure for two days from Sunday when it was found till Tuesday about noon. Uh, just some of the injustices that we have faced from day one. You know, we've been on a search and a SARS personnel, which is a search and rescue call to ask the county to bring out a dog. And the response was why we're not doing the search. I don't wish this on anybody. This is, it's horrible. You know, I, the statistics, you know, 5712 is a number from 2016. And, you know, that's, that's so incorrect because, you know, it, it affects so many more people than that. There's so many more missing and that have been murdered by our digits relatives. You know, during this um, crisis, I've always been the one that, that my kids and, and Aubrey and Christian have came to when they had a problem and I would help them solve it. You know, we'd go on with life. And I haven't been able to do this. I haven't been able to give them closure. I haven't been able to bring Aubrey to them. And I feel defeated, you know. You go to these searches and, and you have hope and and then you have fear and then you have anger and and then you have doubt and and then you feel like a failure, but then in the same breath, you feel relieved because she wasn't there. Maybe there's hope that she's, you know, you try to keep that little glimmer of hope that she's still alive somewhere. But this, this has broke me. I've never been broken. And I've had to reach out for mental health help. I've been put on medication. If anybody out there is dealing with this and, and, and they're new to, the, to a crisis like this, um, you're not alone. There's so many resources out there. There's so many good people out there that can help. You know, we, we have been blessed with, with so many different people, you know, uh, MMIWUSA and Crossroads K-9 Search and Rescue and, you know, numerous other people. And, you know, we're, we're battling this nightmare. And, and when I wake up, I realize this is my life. This is a lie. But, you know, with all the support that we've had, I'm not sure we could have made it this far. And we won't stop. We won't give up until we bring Aubrey home. And I believe after that, we'll continue to help other families as well. And Aubrey lives on in our heart forever. What up? Oh, God, Pam. I just want to hug you and I can't, I am so sorry. And you being this brave in, in, in sharing this story, you know, if someone can provide a clue, um, this, this is a still a very much a live case. And um, I'm glad that you're getting mental health support and that you have that network. 
Um, the canines, um, you really got some support from, is it one organization, which is one that we are asking if you can support because this is work that is extremely hard. You know, you wonder how people get into these things. You don't want to ever call this canine, right? But that's yeah. their life work. So do you want to talk a little bit about Crossroads Canine and, yeah. and the importance um, in something like this? Yeah, they, you know, we, we had no clue where to begin when this happened. You know, yeah. I have a background in law enforcement and I told Christian, I was like, I don't know, where, I don't know what to do. I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do. And um, so we were blessed with um, Crossroads Canine. Um, one of the team members came to us and um, Caleb, and he's been a blessing, you know, he's, they're like family now, you know, I and uh, I was thinking, you know, we don't have the funds to pay for, you know, a, these human rain detection dogs come in. He was like, no, he goes, we're a nonprofit. He goes, we do this on our own time with our own money. And, and they have, you know, showed up whenever we needed them. You know, they've been up here at Oklahoma, um, gosh, I don't know, three or four times. Kayla's been here more. Yeah, there's, I, I've lost count, you know, because of all the different places we've gone. And, mm -hmm. and uh, but, you know, they're amazing. They're, they're not just the fact that they've actually came out to help us, you know, and they get that they're training, you know, they, they they're all that take their dogs through all this training and, uh, you know, get certifications and, you know, they work with them, like, I believe every day. And we've actually seen some, um, uh, actually train on actual um, human remains and ashes. Uh, we actually watched them one day and it's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And we've been so blessed with that. They're magical animals, but the people that can, you know, work with them are also magical. So I'm glad that, you know, that they're, they've helped you and have given you um, some hope at times, but it's just, it's such a roller coaster that you're on. And, you know, you talk about the fact that, you know, the number is 5,600 or 5,700, I think you ch you shared. Uh, from research back, it's dated for 2016 was 5,712, 5,000. Okay. But, but we, we have, you know, Native American, indigenous women, men, women, mm -hmm. uh, girls, you know, um, trans, they refer mm -hmm. also to spirit as well. And, and that go missing. I mean, like daily you know yeah across the u.s and canada so mm -hmm. i believe donna touched on that earlier and it's you know sovereign bodies we've been in contact with them and they're wonderful yeah okay good well i wish you and your family and christian it was his best friend yeah yeah uh so much love and support and whatever we can do to to support what you're doing um tell this story yeah. Thank you. you know, um, thank you. Deep breath. Yeah. You can relax for a little bit. As far as you've done this, yeah. <laughs> you've done this and you did it really well. Thank you. Okay. So we'll see you in a few minutes because we're going to bring everybody back. So if you do have a question for Pam, you know, uh, audience members out there, uh, we will have a chance to visit again. Whew. Okay. Our final storyteller. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Waylon P. Pahona. He's a walker. He walks for causes. And during this journey, as we story mine, so my job is I, I help find the stories that they want to share, and then I help craft them. And uh, this was actually a rehearsal video that he sent. He's like, he was on his walk at 4.45 in the morning starting his walk. He is on his way now from Phoenix to Hopi Nation to do water rights and water quality. And um, he, uh, he submitted this. And the story is about his father and his passing. And it's, it's gritty. It's raw. It's real. But the heart that any storytelling coach would want to see came out in that rehearsal. And so He's lucky he's not doing it live tonight because he's going to we're going to play the video. Now, bear with us. It's it's very reflective of him and uh, and his mission and his character as a man. And uh, 
Uh, it's a little dark, but bear with it. It's a beautiful story. So please welcome this story uh, from Waylon P. Pahona, and it's called 1,867 Miles from Home. I just got dropped off in Pembroke, North Carolina, 1,867 miles away from my home, a place I've never been in my life. Scared, afraid, not knowing what I was going to do. I was dropped off 1,867 miles in Pembroke, North Carolina to see my father take his last breath. My father decided he didn't want to be on dialysis anymore. And so my mom, my uncle, my sister, and my nephew, we drove out. It took us days to get there. And on the journey, you know, I didn't know what to expect. My father didn't want to be on dialysis anymore. And I did some research and found out that, you know, it could take a day, two, a week, before a person officially passes due to uh, uh, being off dialysis. My father was on dialysis for 15 years. So it took us several days to get to Pembroke, North Carolina. It's been a long time since I've seen my father and spent time with him. You know, from his diabetes, he lost half his foot. He lost his kidneys. He lost his hearing and so for years we would just text and so to finally get to Pembroke North Carolina to see my father in his home with his wife it was shocking to see him laying there in that recliner couch to see him laying there like a little baby babbling and, and saying things words that didn't even make sense it was shocking and just crazy to see my father lay there we get there we're only about two hours in into visiting my father and my uncle only has one thing in, on his mind and it's to get this old 3030 rifle that was passed down from my father's father to my father and that's the only thing my uncle's intentions were. So he asks for the rifle. My father's wife, being very disrespected, tells us to leave, to go back home. We just drove 1,867 miles and we were shocked that she was telling us to go back home. I pleaded with my mom. I told my mom that mom, leave me here. Leave me in North Carolina, I'll take care of this. I'll bring my father back to the Hopi Reservation. So my mom and uncles, I'm so upset with my uncle for what he did. My sister, so they give me some money and I stay. My mom and uncle and sister and little nephew leave. I knock on the door and I plead with her. Please, let me stay here with my father. My father has nobody to be here for, with him from his home. She agrees and says under one condition, that you come in at 8 a.m. and you're out by 4 p.m. So I agreed. I find a place that's about 15 miles away from their house. And so on the first day, I show up. My father is still laying in that recliner chair. That whole day, I share with him all the places that I've been, all the keynote speeches that I've given, all the things that I've done for indigenous people, stuff I've never shared with my father before. His wife listens. She invites me to dinner, she says, would you like to eat a meal with me? And I, and, I, and, I, and I eat with her. I talk to her and she's just blown away by all the things that I've done. And I told her, you know, I never shared this with my father because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I knew he missed me. And she said, yes, he did. 
Next day I come back. The next day I come back. She's getting more used to me coming. She lets me use my father's truck. And so from there, I would drive 15 miles back to see my father. I was trying my best because I really wanted to bring him back to Hopi. In this process, I read in a hospice manual all the things that my father was going to go through. And it really helped me to understand, you know, the babbling, the short breath, uh, to see him be agitated, to see all of these things follow suit with the hospice manual. It really helped me understand. By the fifth day, I'm talking, she breaks down and cries and says, I love your father so much. I want him to be here with me, but I know he needs to be with his people. I'll let you take him back under one condition, that we have a service here for him, a church service, and that you take him home and you bury him and uh, have his church service for him. It was tough for me to swallow because I knew my father was very traditional. So I agreed. And so, not too long after, I believe it was the next day, I come back and I sit with my father. And then he finally actually starts talking to me. He starts telling me about things that I need to do. But I knew he still wasn't really making sense. So I start playing some music from him, for him. Some traditional music from Hopi. He hears it, he grabs my phone and he looks at it. He's watching the dancing and then he kind of just slowly gives me my phone back. And then he curls up in a ball like a little baby. And he took his last breath and he was gone. We had that church service for my father. It was amazing to see all the people who came, to see who knew my father. My father wasn't there long and he already had a street named after him, Pahona Street in Pembroke, North Carolina. I then took my father home. My family was upset that we were doing a church service and not traditional. In my mind, I thought, now that I have my father on my reservation, I can bury him our traditional way. But as a man of my word, and I buried my father the way his wife wanted. It was a tough decision. When my father came, we had our wake service for my father. He looked at peace. He looked young. He looked like he was just sleeping. At that moment, I knew that it didn't matter if we buried him in a church or not. I knew in my mind and my heart that my father still stay, stuck to his own traditional ways and regardless of how he was buried, he was buried with pride and dignity of his culture and his history. My name is Waylon. My father is Tewa and Hopi, and my mother is Pipash. And I just wanted to introduce myself, and I wanted to dedicate um, me speaking my mom's Pipash language because um, I love my mom. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, Thank you. I mean, I just, you definitely know Miles, right? <laughs> um, so uh, there's a moment when in your story, when she, the stepmother asks you, there's one condition. Um, will you bury, I want you to bury him in a Christian ceremony and you take this pause. What went on in your mind when she put that very difficult decision on you? 
it, it was it was tough, you know. I really had to think about it, and but I I knew that I had to bring my mom home. I mean, my father home, and so um, you know, I had I had some I had some um, arguments with my father in the past, and I, I he made jokes, and and one time he stopped me and said, "How dare you, you know? How dare you call me a Christian man? You know, I've always grown up traditional." And so he cried when he actually shared that with me, and and so mm-hmm. from then on, I I knew in his heart um, who he was. And so it was tough, but but um, once I finally got him there, and like I said, at the end of the story, he looked at mm-hmm. peace and then I knew I knew that everything was well for my father. He's probably very, very, very proud of you. And uh, it's, it's just a beautiful story. I also have honored that I was with my father on his last breath and it's, it's special, it's a gift that not everyone will have. And, and you were there and you honored him all the way through. Um, I think the hardest part was reliving it again, because I've been walking so much putting, I've been walking four or five hours at a time. And for you to ask uh, me to give a story, it just brought back all of those emotions. So before it was so beautiful, but looking back, it kind of, it kind of had a little um, sadness in my heart. Yeah. That's the, the, the story mining can do that. And uh, you said that uh, it's been hanging with you during your current walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell us about your walk. Tell us about your cause, what you're doing. And uh, we, we definitely would love to have people uh, contribute how we can. So, so yeah, I grew up uh, 18 years of my life in Hopi, um, um, lived there all, um, all, all, all my young years. And, you know, we've always had uh, issues with water, you know, within these past uh Three or four years, I've heard that there's a lot of arsenic in the water, and so you know there was an article that went out and it was shared a bunch of times. and And I know the people who are trying to promote, um, you know, and get help. And so I thought, well, maybe if I walk to Hopi, maybe within these nine days that I walk, I can raise attention. I can, I can, I can gain um, um, money for to buy filtration systems for people in their homes. So. Um, I decided to take the journey on, um, and and so every day I've been walking for the past three months, and it really started when my uncle and Hopi passed away to COVID. You know, uh, we had to bury him wear a hazmat suit, and once we buried him that very next day in June, I completely started running and running, and so from June on, I've been running and walking since, and so that kind of started the ball ro- uh, rolling with me wanting to do this to walk to Hopi. That is amazing work. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, thank thank you and for the people that you're gonna be helping. So that is a good cause. And if uh, people are can take a look at the link that's over there in the comments as to where and how you can support this very strong man doing something very brave and uh, altruistic. So you just have such a great heart. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and and really, I'm honored that I got to work with you on this particular story. You have so many stories, but when you said, I have the story that I, you had told me a few, and I'm like, that's a great story, we'll go with that. And you're like, I have another story. The next day he called me and he's like, I have another story, and it was this one. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is that, that the light starts coming out as your story's ending, like the sunrise is coming up, like it starts off very dark, but then oh, I didn't the even light. Know that. <laughs> I, I did, I was like, the sky's yeah. getting bluer. <laughs> So symbolic, but um, great work, great work. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, okay, you can relax for just like a second, then I'm gonna bring you back, okay? You don't get as much of a long time, but um, all right. That was our six storytellers and I hope you enjoyed this show. It, it, this journey in these last few weeks has just been so magical. Um, Melanin Stories Matter has absolutely changed my life. It's taught me things that I needed to learn and to hear and please tell people, you know, we're going to be doing more shows and tell us your own stories. If you've something resonated with you tonight, we want, this is what this platform is about. Um, if you're interested in sponsoring the show, give me a call. That would be lovely to talk to. But um, I want to thank also uh, a couple people in the background um, that have been just fantastic. And I couldn't do this without them. And that is first uh, BJG Consulting, which is Dr. Brianna Grantham. And she is my marketing director. And she's also the technologist uh, landing airplanes with StreamYard that you're seeing. Um, all those banners that are coming up are, is uh, 
is Dr. B making things happen. So Brianna, thank you so very much. And then Christina, who also works with uh, Brianna's company and has her own uh, photography and video company. She's in Puerto Rico. And so it's a late day for her, but she has been amazing. So the videos that you see that you've been seeing in our social marketing, um, it's the talent of these two women that have been fantastic. Um, so thank you, because I couldn't have done that without you. Um, so that's the, those are our sponsors. Uh, they're fantastic people. I highly recommend them both. And that concludes the show. However, this is still a chance for you to meet the audience. So I would love to have everyone be brought back up. And if you are interested okay. in asking a particular question out there uh, in YouTube land, please do. We're going to be taking a look at them. Uh, I'm sure Brianna's already starting to make banners that are going to come through. And otherwise, I'm just going to let them share with each other. You can let your, whoo, good job. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel? How's everyone feeling? Great. Good. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice all the way here in Hawaii. Awesome, <laughs> awesome stories. Thank you all for sharing. Yeah. So we already have a question. It was, what was the executive order that President Trump signed? Was What was it intending to do? Was that the, I think that's the code talker question. No, that correct? That was that, he was referring to the missing and murdered indigenous women okay. initiative. So, yeah. Does anyone wanna, does anyone know? Oh, sorry, I'm going up here. Uh, yeah, it's a, what is it, Lady, Lady of Justice? And it's basically um, given, we thought it was going to give every state, um, but it gives certain states a task force. Um, and we've been contacted by the one here in Oklahoma um, once. And I don't know, I couldn't give you any details of where they're at or what they're doing at this moment. Um, yeah, just, it's supposed to help, you know, fight the missing and murdered indigenous women. Okay, well, there's attention at least coming from the federal government. That's hopeful, maybe. Um, Donna Baird to Moon. Uh, what football team did you play in Alabama? Ah, uh, the name of the team was Jacksonville State University. It was located in Calhoun County, Alabama. And uh, our, our mascot was the, uh, the Fighting Gamecocks, a rooster. <laughs> Yep. That's what I always hear in my head about <laughs> Kauai. Kauai, you, all you hear in Kauai is roosters everywhere. That's so right. when you say Kauai to me, I hear roosters. <laughs> See, I think they're here. They're recruiting people over here and using the roosters as a recruiting call. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a good question. That was in Alabama. Uh, at that time, I was a Division II school. It's kind of below the Division One and junior and and above the junior college level. So, you know, a lot of guys who didn't make Alabama or Auburn, they uh, they came to Jacksonville State University. So it was highly competitive for making the team, uh, excuse the pun, it was a feather to my hat. I bet. Yep. Thanks for the it's, question. Do you ever talk to your Southern Belle? Uh, no, I, I hear she's married, got a beautiful family. And she's moved on, and um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm stuck here in a, in the 808, and uh, I it's it's stuck. nice, it's nice. Yeah, I'm stuck. <laughs> I, so I'm bad. in Seattle. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Moon. I think it's great that we have Dawn and Moon. Did anyone notice that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good combo. I just yeah. want to I just want to note uh, Michael and, and and the other gentleman uh, Waylon, you guys got a lot of power. You call it Manao, and how about you? A lot of spirit. But, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a my attention span is pretty short, but you guys kept mine, and it's it's a it's an honor to your not only your story but the content of your story. Mahalo, thank you. Thank you, Moon. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I was talking to Moon earlier about his story, and man, when when he was told to get off the property, and he, oh man, that just 
that hits me. That that story. Thank you, Moon. Man. My pleasure. Uh, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's people out there still going through the same thing. Not necessarily in my particular circumstances, but in different facets of life at, at, at various levels. We're all going through it. We're all going through it. <clears throat> we have another question from Donna Baird to Michael. How close was the Code Talker movie to the actual situation? Did you see the movie? The motion picture uh, done by John Wu uh, called Wind Talkers. Uh, so John Wu brought the script to the Navajo Code Talker Association meeting and passed it out to the men. Mm. And a lot of the men told him, we didn't have bodyguards. Can you take this part of the movie out? But if you look at Wind Talkers, the whole movie is about that particular issue about killing the code talker to save the code. Um, Marines don't kill other Marines, flat out. Marines don't kill other Marines. When you go to boot camp, they teach you to fight to the last man. So when I asked, when my dad went to the premiere in LA uh, with some of his comrades, I asked him about it when he got back. Hey dad, so how, how was the film? It's Hollywood. <laughs> you mean Hollywood wasn't honest? It embellished? Oh, it's <laughs> what? No, no, it was actually, uh, you know what's ironic too, is that John Wu is, isn't he Japanese? I don't know. Maybe it's Chinese, but uh, yeah, he wanted he wanted action and bombs, and that's not what the code talkers are about. Interesting. Maybe you could rewrite the movie. Yeah. Right. Okay, we have uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women that you and so many others throughout Turtle Island. Turtle Island is. North America, um, have experienced from law enforcement and so many other government agencies. You are such an inspiration to so many and to your and and to your family. I think that note's probably to you, Pam. Yeah. That's my relative. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. And how are you doing after telling your story? I'm okay. My emotions are all over. I mean, they've been, you know, from the beginning listening to everyone's stories and and the injustice that they've had to face and it just you know it angers me and it breaks my heart at the same time and but sharing Aubrey's story uh, is very important um mm -hmm. different levels and I just you know my emotions are all over so thank you for that. um yeah well during during our story mining you know because there's so much going on in this uh uh Pam um pumped you you pumped a pond because yeah. the dogs, right? Do you want to yeah. tell her real quick that the dogs scented something? Yes, uh, the there's a pond just east uh, or west, I'm sorry, west of Aubrey's at uh, the end of her driveway where she lived. And um, the canine team that came out, uh, four of their uh, certified dogs hit on that pond as well. And so we, you know, they, they sent the report to the county and the county sat on it. And so I continue to call and other people called and um, they finally put a plan together. So they went out the county and uh, local fire department and um, GRDA, which is Grand River Dam Authority, and they had their dive team come out. So um, they just pumped like two to three feet of water out of there, which didn't make much of a difference. And they uh, walked along the edges and they said they drug, I believe it was the, they drug the south end and walked the north end of the pond and uh, then called it quick, <clears throat> said that they didn't find anything, so they were leaving. And so I made sure that they were clearing the scene, you know, that law enforcement was done there. And so I went and uh, got a, a trash pump and myself and a couple other people sat there for like 48 hours pumping that pond all the way. And then once we got all the water out, it was like, um, I'm guessing about three to four feet of mud or more. Um, and we tried to get it, well, you know, give it time to dry out because this was Thanksgiving of last year. Um, day before Thanksgiving is when everybody else uh, flew out. And so I waited about a week and uh, I went back and that was devastating when I returned because I walked up 
uh, on the levee and the pond was filled halfway back up. And yeah, it's... You can't so the imagine the emotions of that. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, we have a book recommendation on code talkers, Michael. Oh, okay. Um, there are actually there's a documentary, and it's uh, it's um, on one of my. I posted it as to one of my causes, and uh, the documentary is uh, the project was called Back to the Battlefield, and so. Um, my father and six other code talkers traveled back to Guam, Tinian, Saipan, Iwo Jima, Okinawa with a family member and told a story. And so if you go to that link, you can, um, if you go to that link, you can click on it and you can actually purchase the movie and watch that documentary of these six oh, men nice. telling the story. So yeah, that's one. Um, I found that a lot of the earlier books, there's one called Navajo Weapon, and there's a weather one, another one called Navajo Code Talkers. Um, those are really raw, and I find that they're they're probably the best source. <clears throat> so yeah, those are those are the two, and okay. of course you can go to the. Um, I also admit. Uh, several websites or Facebook pages, and one is called Navajo Code Talker Day 2020 the Virtual Ceremony. And initially, I started a Descendants page for just the Descendants to share stories with one another. And because that wasn't uh, inclusive, it actually excluded the general public and it's only for descendants. So I created this other page so that we could share stories with uh, the general public. And right now I think we have like 17, 17K followers or 1.7K. So it's a, uh, uh, and, and of course you can contact me and I'm, I'm, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. So there. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, we have a great question for the group. So we're going to do a little round robin. Um, what do you think? This is from Michael Polish, Pollock. Sorry if I've mispronounced my apologies. And it says Wado to all. If I said that wrong, I again, there you go. Uh, what do you think is the one message that you would like to get out to the non-native community that could possibly foster better cross-cultural understanding? Great question. Um, can we start with you, Donna? Yeah, um, I think one message is that we're still here. Um, I think it's really important to understand that we live a contemporary way of life and um, we pay homage to um, our ancestors daily. Um, and that's how we've made it to where we are so far. And we, we hold on to our culture, our language, and our customs. So we are still here. We're not dead. We're not in the past. We're not just living in history books and museums. We are here and we live among you. We're in your classrooms. We're in your workplace. We're, we're at McDonald's. We're everywhere. We're at Walmart, right? right? What did Chris Rock say? Like the, the most natives were gathered in Walmart on the Navajo reservation, right? But, but we're here. So um, I think that's, for me, that's the most important thing to, to take away. Great. Uh, but you said you're in McDonald's and Don's gonna have a problem with that. <laughs> No, 100%. Like, I, I'm just giving excellent. Sorry. So, Don, you want to do you want to refute that? You wanna... I love that video, Donna. It's uh, Dave Chappelle on Native Americans. It's on YouTube. Yeah. And if you want to go see Native Americans, go to Walmart in Gallup, New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all have to agree on that one. That ain't no lie either, because like every teller is busy there. I mean, they open up all the lanes too. So, um, yeah, his bus actually broke down in Gallup, and he went into Walmart in Gallup. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> so, 
to bounce off of Donna, um, yeah, it could either be McDonald's or Taco Hell, you know, you know, <laughs> we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're game anywhere. But um, I think the most important to bounce off of what Donna says, we are still here, but even more so that even though we're Native American, we're indigenous people here, but we're, we're all different tribes. We're mm -hmm. individually different, but collectively united. So understanding that is that don't generalize us. Don't just put us all in one bo box that we all live in teepees or the stereotype stuff, you know? And um, we do all have our own ceremonies, our creation stories. You know, there's, there's more to us than just what you read in the books. And, and honestly, the history books, they're, they're, it's not the truth. You're not gonna find the truth there. So, and um, I think you have that book. I knew you were gonna pull it out. <laughs> I know. This is the first so, thing she sent me. <laughs> so um, just be, be um, vigilant on finding out more of the truth and from the source. You're gonna get the truth from the source rather than um, what are what lies out there in education systems because it's not true. Not all of it. All right. Thank you. Moon, what message would you say to increase uh, well, cross-cultural understanding? Let me shoot a pineapple over the over this bow <laughs> and, and connect with uh, what Donna and uh, uh, Doctor Dawn is a nickname her. <laughs> You know, we, we all have similar, and we parallel the same thing. We had visitors, I, I don't know how many years ago, a century ago, came to the islands and claimed that they were the first people here. That sounds familiar, I'm sure. And they claimed that they were the first visitors of the Polynesian island, and they went back and they brought back, and not only brought back some of their cultures and norms, but they brought their their disease and their way of life. And and it's 2020 and we still somehow kind of in that, as Don was saying, in that shoebox. We're all being stuck together. So, you know, now I think it's a good opportunity to understand our culture, understand what we are and have been asked or asking for so many years to respect our community here in the 808. Bring your Uncle Sam and everybody else, bring your aloha with you, but at the same time, respect our community. Yeah. You know, because we have our own ways and our own cultural practices that we want to maintain. So at the same time, if we give up land or 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 identity or whatever it might be, respect the long run and let's work together. That's all. You know, and, great message. And, you know, I love it. I love it. I love you guys out there, our storytellers. You guys are awesome. Okay, next. Waylon, you next. Waylon's <laughs> in the house. I think, that, I think for me, it's the, the biggest is, is, is respect our culture. You know, now I feel we are the most divided as far as uh, spirituality, you know. I still feel that people, and I'm seeing it more on social media, you know, that there's, and I've said this on one of my lives, you know, people are saying, well, prophecies are coming true. These are things you need to follow Jesus or you need to, to convert more than ever. And I've said that for hundreds of years, indigenous people have been saying these things. You know, we just have to understand and respect everyone because we all have different beliefs. We all have different understandings of how things are gonna happen. But there's always one in particular religion that always know these are sinners or no, this is so, you know, I think it boils down to just respecting one another in our cultures and, and what we do as a, a traditional. Yes, I agree. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Spot on. All right. I'd like to Michael. add on to, um, to what Waylon was saying. And if you look at the way uh, Native Americans pray, well, let's say Akama. Uh, when we do our ceremonies, we go in to the Kiva and we pray for the people. The people don't, the people just don't include Akamas. Mm -hmm. They don't just include Navajos. They don't just include Native Americans. The prayers are for all the people. In Navajo, you look at 
your hand. Let me see where am I? Look at your hand. <laughs> and we are the five finger people, Dene. This is my this is my mom's clan, Eagle Clan, Jami Hanu. This is my dad's clan, Nanastaja Tachini. This is my grandpa's clan, Sun Clan, from Akama. And this is my grandpa's clan, my dad's side, my Nali, and he's Torichini. This is who I am. And that's who makes me me, a human being, a five finger people. We are all the same. We have different cultures, but we are all human beings. And that's the respect that human people, human beings need to do how to treat one another. Right. Everything that is on this earth that is material, especially money, that has no importance in prayer and in our people. Take care of one another as human beings and everything will be in harmony. Beautiful. And that's what life is about. Peace, harmony, love, growth. We all have melanin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was beautiful, Michael. Wow, thank you. Pam? I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> I'm I know. <laughs> I, I just want to say, like, um, you know, the respect is a big thing. Um, we had recently had a, a situation here in Oklahoma where um, it was some kind of like dirt bike racing or something. And they claimed that um, one of our tribes had sponsored them. And then you had people out there wearing headdresses you know, um, other things, you know, inappropriate. And, uh, you know, respect our, our culture is a big thing for me. Also, uh, people that are non-Black, non-Indigenous, non-people of color, um, share the resources that you have that we may not have, you know, that would help out a lot. Because um, going through this uh, nightmare that we're going through, we, we see um, the differences um, they, you know, they, they really uh, came to light, you know, how, you know, people of color don't have the same resources ready, readily available as, you know, your Caucasian people. And it's heartbreaking, you know, and this has opened my eyes to so much, you know, I, and you never dream, you know, this is going to happen. It could happen to anybody, anybody of any color, you know, but I think that'd be a great way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are trying to build the resources on melaninstoriesmatters.com uh, to try and provide information. The library is constantly building. So if people out there have something they want to send us, please do. That would be appreciated. Um, we have one more question and it's Dawn. I think you have a fan <laughs> from your last show. Saw your story about the casino incident. Do you agree that we need to change the storyline about the nation beginning to be honest with our past and confront it? I completely agree with that. I think that our, um, it does need to change. It needs to come to the truth. And that's exactly what we've been sharing right now with among ourselves and with each other and with, with the community out there. Um, we do need to sh share the truth and what is really happening and all these stories that we're sharing right now bring awareness to that and the understanding of it, but we're being respectful about it too, because it's, it's real. We, we face this and not only from our perspective, but others out there and just not being um, silent anymore. I think we, we we're, this movement needs to happen and it needs to be happen and it needs to happen loud, be loud and clear. Okay. And we have from the Chinook Fund, who's been so wonderful. This is our last comment. Donna, in your story, you talked about how challenging this season, the fall, is. What are some actions that individual families, organizations, and communities can do to begin working to be anti-racist? 
That that's a hefty question. <laughs> Watch our show. <laughs> Uh, but um, I think working toward understanding, which we all talked about, like being open to everyone's story, being open to everybody's um, identification and and how we show up, because um, we all identify differently. And um, that goes across the board for persons of color across the board. So if you're talking about somebody who is multiracial, I think it's important to understand that they can be both. Like it's not just a, a one and and it's it's both. So I do have children that are black and native. So um, we do talk about black liberation and indigenous sovereignty tied together in my household and what this looks like. So I think it's important to understand that like my children have difficulty with others explaining that they have dual identity. My son always says, I don't have a problem with who I am. It's others that have a problem with my identity. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he's, he's 18. <laughs> he probably said that when he was 14 years old. So for him to understand where he comes from is, is pretty profound and enlightening for me. Um, I am going to give some resources. Um, so there are some books out there that, um, that I really recommend and they're indigenous authors. So I think it's important, especially during this month, <laughs> well, and um, just to get a better understanding of who we are. So the first book that I would recommend is The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee by um, David Troyer. The second book is An Indigenous People's History of the United States, written by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and um, Debbie Reese. And Debbie Reese has a website um, with a lot of books that she reviews that are written by native authors and non-native authors, but she gives a full review on books. And this is a um, critical and, and important lens to provide for educators that it comes from a native person. And um, so the last book is Our History is the Future. And this is by Nick Estes. Um, and this is a new book that just came out, but um, critical for thinking. And then, um, well, that's not the last book, sorry. I'm gonna list um, from Illuminatives, there are six literary works by native writers, because I, I believe in this, I think this is important. They're there, um, Heartberries, Johnny Appleseed, Bury My Heart at Chuck E. Cheese, When the Light of the World Was Subdued. <laughs> <laughs> our songs, our songs come came through. Um, only good Indians. So um, these are all by native authors, and I I encourage everybody to to look these up and to learn more. And I also encourage you to follow Illuminatives. Um, they do a lot of good work around this and and really making us visible. So thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. The Chuck E. Cheese one was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> A mouse and food. I don't know how that one worked out. And <laughs> okay, this next question, I don't want to. I don't want to be disrespectful if I mispronounce this. So, how about everyone read that one? Because I would not be able to say things properly. Moon, Moon you want to step in? Yeah, the first word is mahalo. That I know. <laughs> it's towards the end. <laughs> Marty Pants. <laughs> oh, plus book ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything between is, is non Hawaiian. Sorry. Okay. This, is, this is what happens, Melissa. When this, this is our humor. <laughs> yeah, I know. I walked right into it. <laughs> uh, all right. Does anyone want to just book ideas? Okay, whatever. <laughs> there is well, a final. Go ahead. Um, Reba, how would we deepen that um, that understanding? Going back to your your question, we don't want to disregard it, but being respectful of, of your question. Um, I, we always offer, we always make an offering whenever we have any kind of events. Um, being mindful of our Mother Earth and acknowledging her first because that's the sacredness first and foremost in our in one of our creations is mother earth gives us life 
and acknowledging that and anything that we perform or do among Mother Earth, even our footsteps in the morning when we when we are blessed to take those steps, um, uh, we would have to say that at that acknowledgement first and foremost is most from from my, my understanding. So if that helps and anyone else. Um, there, there's a great website out there um, to help our allies develop land acknowledgements, and it comes from the U.S. Department of Arts. So um, you can look that up, and they, they walk you through step by step how you can develop a land acknowledgement for your organization. Um, but separate from that, my own personal viewpoint of land acknowledgements, um, we do this, and it's embedded into our language. Um, so I just want you to understand that um, within our own languages and within um, when we greet you, like what you heard from each one of us when we said hello to you in our in our own indigenous languages, we were including um, an acknowledgement, which is an acknowledgement of our ancestors. So and when we say that we're, we're talking about the seven generations. So that means the seven generations behind us and the seven generations um, before us that come after us. And um, we sit in the present, we acknowledge the work that we're in right now, but we also acknowledge how we got here and the work that we're doing in order to, to get us through the next seven generations. So that is really embedded in our languages. So um, we naturally do acknowledgements um, because that's the way we were raised. <laughs> and I, I know that, that's, <laughs> that that might sound um, some, some kind of way or um, somehow. <laughs> um, uh, since, yeah, some, somehow, and maybe that'll segue us into something else. But um, uh, it 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 really means that we we naturally give this acknowledgement um, because our grandmothers told us mm -hmm. to do so. Like we couldn't get here without their knowledge. We couldn't get here without their love and their nurturing and their honesty and their truth and their food and their soft hands, like all of those things. And, and this includes our creation stories. And then we hope to carry all of this knowledge into the future. So, um, but when we ask, uh, when a, when a non-native entity or organization wants to do an acknowledgement, um, I also ask you to be mindful that you're also changing and looking at your policies and, and how you're um, bringing indigenous voices into your workplace or your organization, because that's critical. It can't just be words that, that come out every time you do an event you have to do the work so and include us in that work great thank you the audience has just been fabulous with their questions we have one more and it's to Waylon. where are you walking next and do you have others join you so uh november 24th which is my birthday i start my official walk to hopi so um happy birthday I'm trying, yeah i'm trying not to get too many people to walk with me uh, due to COVID. Uh, my girlfriend and Don will actually be leading the way towards uh, Hopi, so they're they're my uh, my crew so far. So I have a few other people, my son and and, and others that will join me on my walk. I'm trying to not keep too many people, but I'm going to put out an event link on my Facebook, and um, you could join that way um, in putting in miles, just so you can be with me in spirit. Mm -hmm. Lovely, great. All right, everyone. Uh, we are going to end our show uh, for this for this third show of Melanin Stories Matters. Um, you were fantastic. I thank you all. It was a blessing to work with you. I want to see more of you. We are now friends, please. And to the audience, again, thank you for your participation, your support. Tell people we we are coming back. So um, I want to thank everybody. I will give it a little lot, clap and. Uh, we will see you soon. And Cast, if you want to stay and just talk together, we're just going to end the in the live stream in in just a moment. So, good night. <laughs>